Welcome everyone to the second installment of the fall IPM hour. Today we have two alumni from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is in California. Uh, the first is Mary Hableep. Mary received her bachelor's degree from Cal Poly uh, in ag business, and then a master's from Washington State in soil science and ag econ. She's currently an associate professor at OSU, Oregon State University, in extension focused on sustainable agriculture. Mary has extensive experience working on program planning and evaluation and develops instructional design and learner-centered teaching strategies for uh, Oregon State Extension. Uh, the one thing that I noted, I, I did try to work through your whole CV, Mary, but your CV is almost as long as my wife's CV. And I think this is something typical of people who do a lot of teaching. I'm not sure about that, but maybe one day I'll find out. Uh, today, Mary will talk about her adaptive learner-centered education approach. Take it away, Mary. Well, th thanks, Matt. Well, it's great to be here today and talking about a topic that I'm passionate about. I would love to have more people be passionate about. Um, and that's really talking about how do we get people involved in their own learning and moving towards behavior change and IPM adoption. And so today I'm gonna to share about some of the work in Oregon that is heading in this direction. And I'm gonna share quickly about our plan. I think it's important to think about the learners that we're working with. And in this case, most of us in IPM are, are working with adults. So what is it about adults we should know about? And then a specific approach uh, I co-developed in the Northwest and in West Africa, adaptive learner-centered education. And then two examples from Oregon of that work. And then if there's time left, hearing from you all about what you've done and what's working in your programs. So I would love if everyone would like take 30 seconds and think about an educational experience that really worked for you. And then in the chat box, might you be able to enter in what about that learning experience made it extraordinary for you? Is it something about the instructor, something about the experience itself? Just love to hear if, from a few of you, all of you. Oh, thanks, Matt. Oh, the instructor brought something newsworthy about biochemistry. So I'm thinking maybe an application or something real world there, um, kind of bringing the real world into the classroom. It's a great idea. Not one I've heard. You can go way back to when you were young if nothing comes to you from recently. Yeah, Maria, yeah, hands on doing your own learning. I think that's really, really important. Any others last minute want to squeak in? <clears throat> so Al thought he didn't like history. Oh my gosh, an Egyptophile. Yeah, so brought in, oh my gosh, you did a faux dig. That is cool. So yeah, bringing that real world in, connecting you outside the classroom to the bigger picture. I think that's really great. And Amanda, um, talk, talk like normal people, even though we were young. Yeah, not talking down to audiences, empowering you to feel like you're on a, you know, same, a similar plane. Thank you so much. Those are all really creative ones. <laughs> I'm like, wow, those are fun. Well, great. So we'll get back to things here. So before I get started, I just want to thank three really brave extension faculty in, at Oregon State University who worked you know, in new ways with their communities. Um, and I admire them for all they've done. That's Cassie Bosca in Southern Oregon coast, Gordon Jones um, in Southern Oregon, and Darren Wilentz up in Northeastern Oregon. Um, you'll hear more about those folks as I go along, but also there's so many partners, this community partnership element, so many people contributed to make this work. And SARE, Professional Development Funding, made it really work with travel money and other things. So I, I, I hinted at the whole importance of talking about adults 
Um, I think when we have a goal, I think a lot of us have a goal of increasing IPM adoption. But if we're gonna do that, we probably ought to have an approach to doing that. Um, and I will outline one today, there are many, but that really empowers these adult learners to have skill practice, to try out new forms of information, new decisions <clears throat> before they get back to the farm. Right, I think it's a really big ask if we're gonna say, here's some great ideas and now get back to your farm. Um, to really let them try that on to struggle, you know, in their own thinking um, about how different something might be in their pest management if they were to try on something new. And so there's really an adult learners are a unique audience. They have their own characteristics and some of the core principles of working with them are that they should at some level be involved in the planning um, and evaluation of these programs. They should have their knowledge be included um, in their life experience it really needs to be relevant to their life uh, and it really needs to um, take on real world challenges or opportunities. And I really just love the phrase, hopefully not too much jargon, but centering on learners, learner centered. Um, I think a lot of us grew up with teacher centered, which was someone talking at us for long periods of time. So this is in contrast to that. So here we are, Adaptive Learner Centered Education, ALCE for short. As, as I mentioned, it was developed in the Northwest and was taken over to Senegal and tested. So we've done some, gone around this wheel a few times and found that this tends to do a pretty darn good job of getting at some of the most important elements that need to be brought up in educational design and uh, teaching. And so three stages as we go around the wheel with two steps each. Starting over in the blue, um, somebody notices something, right? An extension faculty member, another educator, a researcher notices that there's something needed. There's a challenge or something going on um, where education could help. Um, and the second step is to do a participatory needs assessment process to really hear what those desired outcomes are in the language of that community. And then stage two is a lot of the design work, um, creating, um, a design guide, outcome-based education guide. I'll share that with you today. And then creating learning experiences and those decision support tools, those new forms of information or old information in new forms um, could be either. And then really thinking about our, our teaching and learning. I have a template for that you'll see. Um, and then of course we need to evaluate um, our program, see how we're doing and what it meant. So that first part, that participatory visioning session um, is really to get at the outcomes that people are looking for. And I define an outcome as what learners will be able to do in their lives after a program. So this process takes about a half day. We tend to aim for 15 to 25 people in the room from different angles uh, in the community. That could be farmers, that could be agency folks, nonprofits, um, business people, uh, just a, a host of a range of folks. And they spend a half day together answering a question and they do that by putting on post-it notes the actions that would be possible if they had what they needed. If the research and the extension was there for them, what would be possible on their farms? Then they cluster those into groups and then they name those groups and then those become the outcomes for the program and then there'll be another step coming where you then find out what's, what's education's role um, in that outcome. So I mentioned there's two templates. These will be published by Journal of Extension next month. These are snippets without the instructions without the complete template. So not quite helpful in this format, but Joe um, is in final editing right now with <laughs> the last step. We'll have those out shortly for you to use if they appeal to you. But I talked about that learning outcome comes from that program level outcome that the learners expressed, but then we see where's education's role. And since outcomes form the basis of this design process I'm sharing here, it's really important to get that right. And I will share two more slides about that. But that the outcome contains an action word. What will the learners be doing? What content will they be doing it with? And in what context will they be applying it? And that is what we always come back and check on. Are we staying true to that? Or are we drifting around to maybe Mary's favorite subjects or something like that? That's not gonna get us where we wanna go. 
The next piece is how do we know people are learning? So if they're in the room or we're out in the field, how could I see or measure or hear that learning is making progress? And I think an extension is a big opportunity to do a little more of this. And then we, from there, divide a learning activity where that assessment could be built into, but that allows learners to practice skills, to apply new knowledge um, through active uh, hands-on learning, like Maria mentioned. And then finally, that last step, you know, where academics often can get stuck out here and maybe start here and only stay in that, that step four. The last part is just what is the knowledge that is critical for those learners to be able to effectively complete those learning activities. It's not everything. We never have enough time. And giving people way too much in the setting is not helpful. So having a way to kind of narrow down to that, what is really truly needed is important. So a little bit more on outcomes because I think they're so important. Um, Mary's magic formula. So we start with that action word. And I'll talk a little more about how you get to those, but that action word plus that content, what is it they're gonna be working on and the context where and how is that gonna be applied? So an example from my work, identify is the action word, lower risk pesticide application conditions in the five day weather forecast. There's the content they're working with and the context to reduce off field pesticide losses to sensitive sites. There's a really handy resource that I can't say enough about. If you haven't been using it, I really want you to go online and find one that works for you because there's more than one. And that's Bloom's Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. <clears throat> this was, revived, well, it was created in 1956 by a team of educational psychologists at the University of Chicago, named for one of them, Bloom. It was revised by a student and one of those team members in 2001. This is the revised structure. So online, you can find lists of verbs at each of these levels, those action words, and really getting it at the right level is really important, right? We don't want to be having people create IPM plans if they don't even know the terminology. In the inverse, if they know all these things, we really do want them to be up there creating IPM plans. I find often uh, understand and apply are where programs tend to start um, that I work with. But anyway, really great resource, really helpful. So stage two, the other part is designing decision support resources. And really the point here is to reduce the cognitive load for the learners, the burden of looking at tables with lots of stuff in them, really put it into what is it they need to see that would just support them in taking new actions, making altered decisions. And this is bridges the gap also between the learning experience and the farm or other operation setting. Um, so these are important transfer tools. So we're making around the wheel now. Template number two coming out in Journal of Extension next month. I think this is really important. How do you take that <clears throat> instructional design that you did with your outcomes, your tasks, your activities, and your knowledge and walk into the classroom with that? I always found that to be a mystery. I don't think that was a good idea just to have that. So I created a facilitating teaching and learning template that really calls out um, in a time-based way you know, what is this each segment you're gonna have in your learning experience and what's the purpose of it? I found that really hard when I created this template, just to be honest. Um, and then filling out for yourself, you know, what is the specific activity for each of those segments? What is the role of the instructor or instructors? And what is the role of the learners? Because that should be changing in a learner-centered environment. Where the learners are serving as educators, the learners are doing work and trying stuff on, they're reflecting, they're sharing. So being clear that everybody's role is moving around and making sure the learners also know that. So any questions? Anything come up as sticky or too fast? <laughs> Could happen. Mary, I just wanna say, uh, I love the way that template breaks things down in terms of thinking through your educational plan. Um, uh, that looks really helpful. Great. Well, I'm in copy editing right now, and I'm super excited about people having their hands and, and adapting it to your specific uses. Um, but it's, yeah, really kind of slow down that process and make sure there's time for the things that matter and they don't get, you know, cut off at the end. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Al. Anyone else have a question? No, well, I, I've put my own question in the chat, but I think oh, we can okay. we can always work 
back to that if we have time at the end. Yeah, exactly. This is a really important part. We'll come back to that. Remind me, Matt, if we don't. But he's, Matt was asking about heterogeneity of groups of learners. And yes, and I think there's ways we can get at that. Um, and if there's time at the end, I'll circle the wagons back that way. Hey, Mary, this is Jim. Um, I, <clears throat> I had a question um, about motivation, right? So no. we want we want people to adopt IPM practices, right? We want more IPM adoption. What is it that would motivate someone to actually do that, right? Like, why would they want to adopt an IPM practice? And I think, you know, sometimes thinking about that really helps me mm. design um, how to talk with people about IPM um, practices. That's a really great point. And in the project I'm not talking about today with cranberry pesticide resistance prevention, I worked with that faculty member to really flip the whole thing around and think like a farmer. You know, to, what is it that the farmer needs to know when they're gonna go shopping for a pesticide or they're gonna go into the storage shed or make a plan? And what are the things they need to know that are important for their decision-making? Cause it's not everything. And yeah, when I get done with this book, Oh my gosh, I just bought this. It's huge. <laughs> I'm very interested in the concept of motivation. I think tying into people's real worlds, understanding what challenges they're facing. Um, I think letting them work on things that matter to them in the learning experience that they can build upon further at their farm or ranch. I, mean, I think there are some key um, letting them share their knowledge, letting them help inform others about what works or doesn't work. Yeah, great point, Jim. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I only briefly got a glimpse at that book, but sometime I... Yeah, enhancing, I adult, I adult, enhancing adult motivation to learn. Okay. Oh my goodness. I saw it and bought it and I went, oh, I've got to move this on to the to-do list. Because <laughs> I do think, you know, they're there voluntarily. Um, change, a lot of this is voluntary. And so how do we serve as, you know, sources of inspiration and motivation to overcome those changes in behaviors and taking those risks and bringing down those barriers to change. Great, great point. So two examples from Oregon. Um, and one is called the, where we applied this adaptive learner centered education approach, ALCE. The Middle Road Pesticide Stewardship Partnership, Gordon Jones led that um, project more towards the end. It was taken on initially by Rick Hilton um, at the Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center. And now Gordon was hired and he's taken over. And then the biologically based IPM for Northeast Oregon cropping systems led by Darren Valenta. Those are the two. So uh, pesticide stewardship partnership is an interesting um, creation here in Oregon. Um, it's of a multi-agency voluntary process to reduce pesticide detections in surface water in different watersheds. And so the Middle Rogue had some pilot testing done and they didn't get flagged really high. A lot of herbicides, some mixes, um, but they actually wanted the Pesticide Stewardship Partnership, which is really interesting because a lot of communities come to me and say, how do we not get involved in that program? How can we stay out? Well, they wanted to protect the water quality uh, in their area and took that on. And, and so, Something else. So we started with step one. We, we, we knew there was a problem, right? We heard there was a problem. We heard they wanted to work on it and then went into a visioning process um, with a group of folks, including extension in the room, um, farmers, agency, um, county employees, um, nonprofits, others, and two that came out that we thought we could help with of uh, the outcomes were um, taking action on validated information and tools to implement higher levels of IPM. And then really that idea that everyone in the watershed has a role to play, different pesticide user groups, even homeowners, landscape care, you know, roads, not just agriculture. Um, so we knew right away we, we were gonna be building a bigger partnership. We often have worked just with ag in the past um, PSPs that, that we'd been involved with in the state. So, we got different people to come to the table um, and built a really robust um, group uh, that has now written a five-year strategic plan that's even online that outlines who's doing what, why, and where. Um, and so 
this team has really helped us move this forward and have different processes going in different parts of the watershed with different user groups. And then we meet up, um, well, okay, whoops, sorry, stage two again, decision support. Gordon Jones took it on himself to coordinate and create a set of prepping calendars for different commodities um, grown in Southern, as part of Southern Oregon. And these really help folks to just quickly notice when the key pest control activities are during the year. And more importantly, down there with those blue and green boxes, what are the weather drivers um, for pesticide losses that might be happening commonly in those time periods? So they can really check the weather, be more attentive, um, and hopefully um, reduce offsite losses. That was really handy all in one spot because this was multiple things in one place. So whoops, now the next part. So we decided to create this thing called the IPM Festival every year. Um, and it's grown to be, um, we've got demonstrations on the right. There's Gordon Jones in the top there holding the, the sprayer, the air blast sprayer um, samples that uh, for calibration. And on the left, uh, a field tour actually being led by a uh, freshwater trust talking about managing vegeta unwanted vegetation on uh, riverside habitat uh, projects for res restoration. Uh, really interesting cross learning. So we bring in a lot of different um, folks. We have farmers as educators um, and others to really get at, we even have breakout groups for homeowners, for agriculture, um, just a really diverse way of trying to come at this. Everybody's got a role. And at the last one, 90% said they would be adopting new practices to protect water quality. And one of the teaching and learning tweaks we did in that one was it created a form for them to write down what it is they were gonna do differently. What were they committing to? And then to share that with at least one partner in the room, which was quite a fascinating thing. Everyone was sharing what they were gonna do. So really trying to send something home in their hand that they wrote <laughs> that they want to do. And that could even be finding new information, um, but getting more information to make a new decision or the decision they'd already made to, to change a practice. So switching over up into the Northeast corner of the state led by Darren Walenta, um, he just does a lot of work in IPM and knew he wanted to really hone in on what was most important to his community. So he really asked a broad question um, of his community, which was ended up being 23 people in the room, which was really big, we had a big group, um, spending a half day together, envisioning different areas of, of interest. And then I did a tweak here where I gave everyone five dots and they got to vote on the different, I think we had nine categories that were clustered um, out from the bulk of the activities. And the one that got the most votes just by a little bit um, was to expand uh, IPM options for mint and grass seed, focusing on biological control. And so that's where we went to work. Um, and so the it became clear right away that we would need some more decision report support for these folks. We do have some leading farmers. So this is very much a co-led process. The farmers, some of them are experimenting on their farms with beetle banks, with cover crops, with various plantings and already having some positive results. Um, they want more research and more extension. Um, to really find out what are the best things to do, the most high impact to kind of have their, have a more resilient system um, in the face of possible um, chemistry losses and chlorpyrifos back in like, 2017 was on the table to be removed. Um, so they were thinking ahead towards how could they be more resilient at their farms. And so if someone's gonna be installing more habitat, check time, um, on their farm, you need to know a couple things, right? You need to know what, your pests, you probably know what those are, but what are the, the natural enemies that can help you manage those pests? So that would be step one, right? Pests, what are the parasitoids? What are the predators of these pests that you wanna re reduce? And then secondly, if you know the thing you wanna bring onto your farm, what is it that's gonna attract them and host them for their life cycle? So this is where the project really started building out. We reached out to Eastern Oregon University, a native plants nursery, um, the reservation, the tribe there, um, plant experts, the uh, Functional Agricultural Biodiversity Group funded by the IPN Center. Um, so really 
quite a few people to put together this resource for the planning process for this increasing habitat on your farm. And then in this pro project, really the farmers are also teachers. Um, they are really out on the front on this one. Um, we don't really necessarily have trials on the station looking at these different practices per se for Northeast Oregon, um, but they're really testing out, seeing which plants work, you know, that aren't weedy, that survive, um, that do the right thing at the right time. Obviously all that bloom and resource, uh, winter habitat. So we've started this pro project in the classroom then we moved it to the field, um, touring some of these farms and bringing out experts to talk about bats, snakes, birds of prey, you know, other predators in the system. Um, and when we asked, you know, the growers what they were interested in changing, they mentioned that they were going to change their practices often around mow mowing and tillage to be less disruptive of the natural enemies, but also some of their pesticide management practices to protect some of that habitat. And then finally, this just got published this summer. This is a, um, a, another OSU extension publication that is online that outlines these three partnerships and kind of what we learned from each of them, sort of the highlights. Um, so that's available to everyone. And I will put some URLs in the chat box um, that can lead you to both of those publications I in mentioned and also my blog. Um, and once a month, every second Thursday at noon Pacific time, I host the Extension Teaching Network. So that's tomorrow. If you email me, I'll send you the Zoom link where we just talk about any of the challenges of designing, implementing online, in-person, in-field extension education programs. And it's now people across the nation. It tends to be a small group, um, but you can bring your problems, your, <laughs> your successes um, to those, those groups, the meetings. Um, love to have you. So anyway, I just think for this, these projects to be sustainable, there's really an, an engaging that community part because the, those, these projects are ongoing. Um, they're self-supporting mostly with the energy of people. Um, sometimes we need money, but anyway, that's it. Well, thanks, Mary. That was really terrific. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions right now now but if anybody would like to unmute and ask a question by all means have at it we have i have a, few a question for right? questions yeah go ahead um in the in the the rogue river project was that the first time you had asked people to publicly sort of share write down and share what they planned to do and have you followed up on that to see you know does that increase success that's one thing in, in community-based social marketing that i've that they claim is that you get somebody to make a public pledge, they're more likely to follow through. Um, so have you have you followed up on that? Yeah, we did some follow-up evaluation. It is harder than you'd think to get farmers to, we did some interviews um, and we did some surveys and you know, the data set was pretty small and we need to repeat this again, you know, like across events, across time. Um, I just think anytime you get people to stop and think, and I think that's part of this more learner-centered lens to do their own learning, to think about, reflect, build some of that discussion time in. Um, so I built, we built time in for them to say, you know, what of all you saw would really work for you and that you're committed to doing, and then go share those things, share that with others and hear what they brought up um, for their idea of a new practice they could commit to. Um, yeah, I think you're right. We could do a little study. I could put that in the hopper. There you go. Yeah, and so the, the, the group's not being homogeneous, right? I think extension is one of these most difficult um, learning environments because you don't necessarily know who's coming. You know, if you have, even if you have registration, you don't necessarily know their background on the subject. And so some of these learning activities using small groups, letting people do their own thing or not do the learning activity as might be appropriate for some. Um, can allow people to adjust or some people be more educators in the small group with people who are maybe not as advanced or needing assistance. Um, I think that's where that assessment comes in. When you see people struggling, you can go over to that table and say, hey, how can I help out here? Or how can someone over there help you? Um, but I, I think that could be a subject of a whole session. <laughs> so I'll stop because I see the time. Thanks, Mary. Are there any other questions for Mary? 
Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, I did want to point out that Mary put uh, three uh, URLs in the chat for two extension publications for Morgan State and her blog. So if you want to copy those down, I have already copied them down and pasted them into a file, so I have them for later. All right. So our second speaker today is Jeremy James, who is currently the chair of the Department of Natural Resources Management and Environmental Sciences at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, Jeremy received his doctorate from UC Davis in uh, plant sciences and a bachelor's degree in ecology from Cal Poly. And his work at Cal Poly and, and also here at the University of California has been focused on restoring natural lands and rangelands uh, following plant invasions. And today, Jeremy is going to talk about managing Medusa head in rangelands. So, yeah, All right. so Thank you, Matt. I'm here. Should I go ahead and take it away? Yes, please. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's really fun to be able to reconnect with some of the, the IPM work. I, I miss some of this more than anything, switching jobs. So um, really, really was, was excited to see the invitation and just been able to kind of revisit with you folks, share some of the work we did with the University of California and just uh, have a little discussion around that. I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay, Matt? By all means. Okay. Yeah, I spent, uh, we all spent a year and a half on Zoom, but I'm already trying, I'm already forgetting how to do things on it, which I guess is probably a good thing. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk um, today about some work that we did up at the Sierra Foothill Research and Extension Center, which is one of these great facilities that the University of California Ag and Natural Resources has. Um, that was focused on coming up with some potentially integrated strategies to manage uh, one of the most serious rangeland um, invasive plants we have, which is Medusa head. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get some great support through the Western IPM Center for this work and Western SER and, and Corteva. Um, you know, there's not a lot of money to be made on, on rangeland grazing. So getting money to fund the IPM work and, and getting ranchers interested is not always the most straightforward thing because there's sometimes not a huge amount of dollars available on the table, but um, there are some pretty significant ecological impacts that invasive species have on um, our natural lands, including rangelands. And of course, you know, one of the... Um, justifications for deploying IPM strategies uh, to mitigate IPM is, is to help mitigate these ecological impacts. So it's not just an agricultural production side of things, but what these invasive species could do for these uh, systems here. So what I'm going to talk to you today is, is an effort to kind of scale up some management strategies that we've been exploring for invasive plants, um, particularly in Medusa head on rangeland. I'm going to touch briefly on some small plot trials we did and some of the conceptual um, rationale that drove some of the research. Uh, but the crux here is really, okay, we understand how some of this works on small plots. What if we do this at more of a management scale? And I think most of us know when we try to scale out treatments, um, things aren't always as, as clean and easy as they would appear on our small plot studies. So that's kind of the rationale here. Um, but just real quick for Medusa head, it's actually um, originally from the Mediterranean Eurasia area, um, pretty widely distributed across much of the Western United States. Now you can see the distribution here in California. Um, interestingly enough, it's an invasive plant that does quite well on the east side, um, Eastern Oregon, Eastern California and the high desert, um, but also can do quite well in California grasslands, sort of on the uh, west side of the Sierra Nevadas and the coast range. So pretty widely ecologically distributed. Um, in the system, like in the Sierra Nevadas, like we, or the Sierra Nevada foothills, like we see here, um, the management issues become really complex. They, they started off complex, but they're even more complex in, in these foothill regions. And the reason being is that Medusa head is an annual grass um, that's invasive but establishes and, and sort of expands within a network or an ecosystem of other annual grasses and annual forbs in California. 
Now, most of these annual grasses and annual forbs are not themselves native, but they're not really considered noxious or invasive. They're more sort of introduced plants. And so from a management perspective, it's quite hard to um, uh, figure out how in the world you can manage an invasive annual within a network or a community of other annual plants. So the uh, management situation is fairly unique to California. And what we've generally tried to tap into as a key to unlock unlocking this IPM problem is the potential to use um, slight variations in phenology to our benefit. Um, and the basic idea is, is shown in this graph here where Medusa head tends to have a later phenology than the other desired annual grasses and even the annual forbs. So the annual for, forbs kind of go through their life cycle. Uh, they start that the earliest and complete it the quickest. Um, our annual grasses, our desired annual grasses are second. And there's usually, I don't know, like a, a two week period um, where Medusa head lags. And that particular species tends to complete its life cycle a little bit later in the spring. And so, you know, um, managers and ecologists um, have known this for a long time and have really kind of used this as the way to maybe crack um, that code. Um, you can see here just some of the basic phenological stages that um, we've tried to look at a, a, a bunch of researchers, you know, some ideas like, you know, if you adjust the timing of grazing or mowing, maybe you can negatively affect Medusa head more than the other species. Um, there's been some trials around that and, and some successes, um, which definitely gives us some encouragement that these slight differences in phenologies could be exploitable in an IPM type of program. And we partnered um, a number of researchers here, and some with U uh, University of California Cooperative Extension and then um, some other folks out of state um, to run some small scale trials to um, look at the potential of using a growth regulating herbicide, so aminopyrrolid, um, typically used for uh, maybe broadleaf control. And what we wanted to examine here is if we strategically sprayed on aminopyrrolid um, onto vegetation ripening plants at certain times of the year, if we could actually sterilize some of the seed of Medusa head and not sterilize some of the seed of our desired plants. And for folks that are kind of in this, this research area, you know, we've known for a long time, um, if we spray broadleaf selective herbicides at the wrong time of year, for example, in our cornfields or something, grain fields, if we spray it at the wrong time, we actually have some negative impacts um, on our grass type crops, um, where we cause the seeds to abort, remain unfilled and, and the crop to fail. So the idea here is if uh, maybe we purposely want to have a seed crop fail. And so we wanted to know if we sprayed small uh, rates of amino pyrrolid in the spring at certain times, if we could actually cause seed sterility in Medusa head um, and hopefully not cause it in our other plant. And the idea here is that slight two week difference in phenology might give us a window where our desired plants are semi protected from the herbicide because their seeds would have matured and, and at least hardened enough to not be negatively impacted by the herbicide. But Medusa head would be potentially susceptible. So we ran a series of small plot trials across the three sites across the state over two years looking at different rates of amino pyrrolid here applied either in spring or fall. And, um, you know, collectively we found pretty strong evidence that, yeah, we can, we can identify and exploit that small window of time to negatively impact Medusa head seed production over desired plants compared to desired plants. So we felt pretty good about that. We felt it was a pretty robust screen, um, but what we obviously weren't doing is looking at management scale application. So, the objective of, of this study was to see how this um, technique scaled out. And what I want to do is just spend um, one minute talking about what the issues might be. And there's a couple issues, you know, driving a tractor across rangeland. Uh, there's things like rocks that uh, kind of make your applications not work so well. Um, there's application rates and spray patterns, all these, all these things that could. Um, 
you know, make small plot studies not as uh, come across as effective on large scales. The other thing we're wrestling with here is phenology. So here's just sort of a degree shadow effect across uh, rangeland, uh, just an example of rangeland. And we know that you know certain slopes, certain areas that have different aspects are going to receive different thermal loads, uh, which may cause some vegetation in some areas to develop faster uh, than other areas that are, are getting lower thermal loads, lower degree days. We also know that shallower soils will tend to make our vegetation accelerate uh, their phenology. Um, you know, all of this is to say, if we're going across the thousand acre ranch, we can guarantee that uh, Medusa head and other species are not gonna all be in the same phenological stage. And why this may seem natural for us as ecologists, um, you know, if the premise of our uh, treatment is really on this two week window, then it could be very likely that um, this heterogeneity makes our treatment not very effective. And it's important for us to know this if we're gonna tell land managers and, and ranchers to consider scaling these, these treatments up. So really what we wanted to ask here is, is how do these treatments that we know work at small plots, how do they work at, across the landscape? So we set up two studies. Um, we established 10, eight, replicated 10 acre plots um, across the Sierra field station here. And we, we combined a couple simple treatments. One, the plots were either grazed or not grazed, and they're either sprayed or not sprayed. So pretty simple treatments done at 10 acres though. And we sampled, you know, stratified across these entire uh, 10 acre pastures. So we could really account for maybe some potential heterogeneity. Uh, the reason um, we included grazing here um, and, the, and the reason this is really sort of an IPM concept is, is twofold. One, we do know that Medusa head can be negatively impacted by grazing. Um, so in a sense, if we have plots that are both grazed and sprayed, um, there's potentially multiple control points uh, for this invasive plant. But we also had some suspicion that grazing might help us um, sort of make the phenology a little more uniform across the pasture. We didn't know if this was true, uh, but the hope was by having some grazing activity out there that we can sort of synchronize the phenology a little bit tighter in some of these pastures. Um, so that was kind of two mechanisms and two ways that we were hoped grazing might have an interaction with the spray. Uh, these were replicated three times, um, not a high level of replication with a large spatial scale. Um, but something we hope gave us a little bit of statistical power. We did do one companion study here. I'm going to show you data on both. In this companion study, we wanted to know how sensitive these treatments were to the timing of application. So the phenology of Medusa head uh, is quite quick, like the other annual grasses, and they, they, tra they transition across these phenological stage from sort of elongation to boot stage, the seed head emergence just within a couple of weeks. And the question we wanted to ask is how well does herbicide work if you are a little bit later on your spray or a little bit too early um, with the idea that pastures are gonna vary in their phenology. So what's kind of that window of efficacy um, that we wanted to, to look in? We, and here we adjusted the, uh, the volume of application as well. Um, just a little commercial on that. We didn't see any effects of volume, so we're not going to see that again, but we did um, uh, examine that as well. So we'll just look through um, the two sort of series of data, I think. So some nice pictures real quick of these plots. You can kind of see the uh, contrast there on the lower, late, uh, lower left there of a grazed and ungrazed area. Um, Fairly productive areas, again, mostly dominated by annual grasses and forbs, and um, fairly high Medusa head in most of these pastures, which gave us a, uh, a good study area that would be representative of what most, a lot of managers might consider treating. So, what we're going to show you here is percent germination of seeds collected on four species with Medusa at the top. 
And then followed, we have three desirable annual grasses, soft broom, wild oat, Italian rye. Um, over two years, so these are they, uh, seeds collected in 2018 and 2019 in plots that were either sprayed with amino pyrrolid or not. So the circles are sprayed with amino pyrrolid. And I, what we can mostly see um, for both years, 2018, 2019, our application at large plot scales, uh, we're still able to sterilize Medusa head seeds successfully. So we went from about 90% uh, germination percentage of seeds to maybe about 45% in 2018 and, and slightly lower or probably substantially lower in 2019. Um, these sterility rates were not as high though as what we saw in the small plot study. We had about 95% sterility, so only about 5% seed viability in Medusa head. So while we saw a treatment effect here, um, the effect size was, was smaller than the small plot study. Um, so there are some things going on here. Soft brome did take a little bit of a hit with amino pyrrolid application, and so did annual rye. Um, overall, the, man, the, the magnitude of the decrease on germination was, was not as much as Medusa head. This graph here, there's a lot going on, but this is basically just changes in cover with uh, treatments. So again, we have multiple species here. We have our grasses, including Medusa head up top. And then we also show you the uh, forb response in the bottom. So fillery, highly desirable forb, and then other forbs at the bottom. And what this is showing us is how cover of these species uh, or functional groups changed with uh, herbicide application. And if we start with Medusa head, we can see when we applied amino pyrrolid that we have evidence that that change in germination percentage actually did result in a change in cover, which is important because it could easily be that we decrease seed germination, but cover does not change because there's enough seed. Uh, but for both years of Medusa head, we did see a decrease. Again, the uh, effect size is not as large as we saw in the small plot, um, but was still significant. For soft broom, we saw no changes. Wild oats, um, a little bit of a positive increase with amino pyrrolid application, same with Italian rye. Our forbs were somewhat negatively affected by amino pyrrolid. So you can see that fillery and other forbs uh, declined with the amino pyrrolid application. And that's, that's a risk and a cost that's, that would be pretty logical since these are uh, originally uh, you know, sort of broadleaf uh, designed herbicides. So our broadleaves uh, did have a negative effect. Um, then just some data from the second trial. And just to refresh you, the second trial asked the question, how sensitive uh, are seeds and these species to the timing of spraying? So if we were off, if we were like two weeks early or two weeks late, what happens? And so for Medusa, we see that, uh, you know, the first dot there is control. So those are plots that were never sprayed. We can see that anytime we sprayed between sort of elongation and uh, sort of seed head emergence, that we had a negative effect on Medusa head seed germination. Soft broom, that was not the case. Uh, soft broom was pretty resilient across those stages. Uh, we did see a slight decline if we went uh, a little early, but that was you know 10% or so. Wild oats, um, no effect, and um, Italian ryegrass, no effect. Um, and it seemed for Medusa head going a little bit later, Aaron on the, the side of going a little later was probably a little more beneficial. This middle point is really the sweet spot. So it's when Medusa head's in the boot stage and we knew from our small plot trials that it was most susceptible to the herbicide. But it seems if we're a little bit past that stage that the seeds are still susceptible to amino pyrrolid. Um, going early helps some, but there's obviously a lot of uh, variation in that. And then um, just lastly, same, same uh, companion study, but just looking at changes in cover. 
And we can see from Medusa head, um, spraying later again that resulted in lower seed production did result in a, a larger decline in Medusa head cover. So if we were gonna to try to link these two studies, we might assume that areas of our pasture that didn't uh, get controlled very well by our spray might've been, um, that might've been because Medusa head was um, in too early of a phenological stage and we were too early in that spray. Um, it seems like we have a little bit more latitude going later. And then in terms of um, the other species, we didn't see uh, huge negative effects of spraying um, later. Wild oat um, took a little bit of a hit if we went too early. Um, so, did, uh, uh, so did soft roam. And our forbs again went too early. We hit those. So most of this makes sense. So from a management perspective, uh, we can definitely recommend if we want to try to scale these out, we want to be pushing things a little bit past the boot stage that could potentially give a little bit more protection to our forbs and our desirable grasses without incurring, you know, any negative costs for um, Medusa head reduction. So I think just kind of um, the major conclusions on this um, is that that selectivity of amino pyrrolid it's dependent on, on phenology, but we do have some window to operate there. And uh, as we talked about, you know, it's, it's gonna be better if we, if we scale this out to be on the later side and uh, as opposed to the earlier side, uh, but there's still gonna be some challenges of treating large areas. The, we didn't see, um, any interaction with grazing, you know, I sort of went past that, but for all these treatments, the grazed and the ungrazed uh, pastures responded the same. So we didn't get any additional management effect with grazing, uh, whether that was due to uh, grazing impacts, negatively impacting the use of head or, um, you know, grazing being able to help us unify our phenology. So um, it doesn't mean we should stop grazing for uh, Medusa control, but there just wasn't any uh, interaction here uh, with that particular treatment. So we're pretty excited about this. Um, I think we just kind of got this through the peer review process and, and, and to us it was really useful to get a little bit more clarity about the small plot work and give us a little more confidence about what we could talk to our managers about. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if there's any time. Yeah, we definitely have uh, some time for questions. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the, oh, let's see, here we go. There's one from uh, Steve Young. Uh, let's see, um, have you used indazoflam in any of your research? And uh, if so, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't have any experience with that. Um, I have not used that in any of these, these companion trials at all. So don't have any experience. Good question though. If anybody else has a question, by all means, um, either drop it in the chat or you can take your mics off mute and uh, you can ask your question that way. Uh, I was gonna drop one in the chat, Jeremy, at, at mine is, uh, pretty mundane. I was wondering, those error bars, are those standard errors of the mean or are they just straight up standard error bars? Oh, sure. Yeah, great question. I didn't uh, didn't talk about those. Those are actually a 95% confidence intervals. Oh. Yeah. And as, as you notice, a lot of them are asymmetric. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was curious about that because some of them turned up to be significant and I thought, well, that, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good, good catch. Thanks. That was not a mundane question at all. So here's one from Steve Elliott. Oh, go ahead. Jim, do you want to ask yours first? Uh, no, I'll, I'll wait for Steve's question. Okay. So Steve asks, does EPA's new restrictions on feeding plant material uh, affect grazing as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe Steve Young knows. I, he's up there at USDA now, so. Yeah, that's right. Oh, he says he's, okay. 
or maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nope. There you go. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jim. Good answer. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, I was wondering, um, how does this fit with uh, really pretty tight economics of running a, uh, an operation based on grazing? Sure. Excellent question. Um, part of this <clears throat> line of research, we did um, look at some economic impacts as well that was supported by uh, Western IPM, which didn't have time to get into today, but really, really useful. Um, and what we see base, basically doing just some very basic analysis is that, um, you know, there's a lot of, of room in, in grazing decision making to try to basically um, either uh, reduce, like mitigate the effects of annual plants on your economics or to make them worse. Mm -hmm. And so for most of these um, IPM type treatments, you you definitely wouldn't come out ahead on just straight uh, economics, you know, without any subsidy. Um, and in most cases, even with some sort of subsidization or something, uh, probably wouldn't pencil out. So these would definitely be more in the realm of ecosystem services and trying to restore some, some ecological diversity, uh, where we probably get the, the, the best economic value out of it. Um, for most of the work we've done, it's not comprehensive. You know, there's a lot of things going on with, with feed availability and drought and everything in California, but um, there's a lot of management options that you can do first to recover your economics before you have to go do a bunch of spraying or something like that. So yeah, really good question. Okay, any additional questions for Jeremy? Oh, I lost my mouse. Oh, there it is. Oh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, from Al Fournier, he asks. Oh, no, never mind. That's not a question. All right. Jeremy, thanks again. That was yeah. really great. Uh, appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today um, about the project. Certainly very important from the standpoint of rangeland and natural areas management um, for us in the West. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure everybody knows, let's see, our next installment for the IPM Hour will be uh, October 10, is that right, Steve? November 10. I mean October 10, November 10, sorry, uh, at noon. And do we have, we have speakers already, right? We have two topics. Uh, yeah, we'll have harvest weed seed control um, in Colorado and then steam um, as a treatment for lettuce and pathogens in lettuce. So Outstanding. We're continuing the diversity of topics. Outstanding. Just for Al. Just for Al. <laughs> all righty. So thank you all for uh, joining. That concludes our uh, IPM hour for this month. And hopefully we will see you all next month as well. Uh